Stanford University. Tom, I'm really pleased we have a chance to get back for part two to continue our conversation for the Stanford Oral History Project and to really do a deep dive on what, you, what happened to you at Stanford and, and what your life was like. But f uh, to begin, I'd, I'd like to read a quote from one of your former students, John Chaffee, who is now himself a distinguished faculty, emeritus faculty member at Stanford. And here's what he said when you received the IEEE Medal of Honor Award. Uh, that's IEEE's highest award. Speaking as one of his many PhD advisees over the years, but I suspect for most, I would say Tom Kyleth is more of a father than just an advisor. He continues to look after the interests of his former students carefully, decades after they've graduated. His group just has to have been more successful than any academic group in, in electrical engineering history. That is a tremendous credit to Tom, his energy, his intelligence, and his encouragement. And I also note that when you received the National Medal of Science last year, this nation's highest award in science, they mentioned this idea of your skill and enthusiasm uh, in mentoring young scholars. Why don't we start today by talking about the kinds of students you've had the, the, and what you were able to do to bring out the best in them? <laughs> well, uh, I suppose there's some element of luck also. But uh, if I go back, I remember that uh, you know, I had a certain amount of international visibility and in the country as well uh, through my master's and PhD thesis at MIT. And so faculty knew me and uh, when they was at Stanford, they would encourage their students to ask them where they should go and so on. Well, why don't you try Stanford where Tom Kyleath is? So I had, uh, my first student was from Holland Peter oh. Schalkwick, two years younger than me, <laughs> but he was a top student from Holland. <coughs> and he came, uh, my third student, I think, third or fourth, was Jim Amora, who uh, grew up in the valley, actually, is of Japanese origin, was uh -huh. in an internment camp really? as a young kid. Went to MIT, did very well, but wanted to go, to go back to the West Coast, and he was thinking of Berkeley. But his advisors at MIT said, you know, why don't you try Stanford? <laughs> so, so, and this has happened uh, over the years that people send me their top students and so on. So, I, first of all, I have very good material. And uh, many of them were toppers in the quals and so on. So, the other thing I think, though, is, as some students have said, I had lofty expectations of them. And my belief is that you know, that challenges people to do their best. And uh, I worked them hard, and if you read some of the acknowledgments, uh, Michel Gevez, another top student from Belgium wrote, he's never worked so hard in his life as in the latter part of his PhD thesis. So uh, I have high standards, I challenge them, I ask a lot of questions. And uh, I think that's what research is, asking questions. And uh, you, uh, other students have written that, you know, they would come into my office. My office door was always open. And if someone, and I had office hours, of course, and uh, regular seminar meetings and so on. But if someone appeared at my door, one of my students, and said, I have something to tell you, I said, is it interesting, come in. And maybe we'd spend a couple of hours very good. Talking about it. And Hanok Levari wrote that uh, he'd come in with what he thought was a final polished result, but after a couple of hours of discussion, he'd walk out and say, hey, there's much more work to be done here to try and get the simplest understanding of what a result is. It's not just mathematics or just the result by itself. Is it how does it fit into things? Why is it coming out the way it is? Is this the most natural proof? Are there other things suggested? So, in fact, another student wrote, uh, he quoted a po poet, and now I uh, can't remember the names, many years ago, saying, 
this poet had written that if he had a vision of hell, it would be with uh, demons constantly asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to follow up. I have a quote from one of your students that I think is, is terrific. And the, and the quote was, was this, um, because it's not just one student, but a number of them said, um, the quote was, there are 168 hours in a week, <laughs> so what have you been doing? <laughs> I love that quote. That, you talk about having high standards. No, no, that's <laughs> stolen, actually. That's a stolen quote. It's still a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> when I first came to MIT from India, you know, Kamar, and I'd looked at things and so on, and you're a research assistant, and you interviewed the head of RLE, the Research Lab of Electronics, a very salty character called Henry Zimmerman. And uh, so he said, you know, here are the rules, introduction to the place and so on. And you can only take two courses a term because you're on research mm -hmm. and so. So I said, can we audit courses, you know, because I mean, there's so many, it's a galaxy of courses here, full uh, plate. He said, no problem, you know, there's 168 hours in the week, you can do what you want. <laughs> That's right, but you have to sleep somewhere in the, in yeah, the, right. in the, in the middle okay, of that. So that's what I, <laughs> so I, I, I meant it, and I told them the story, actually. But no, you know, I mean, another thing I would tell them is, if you feel your understanding of the subject, you should reach a level of understanding in a subject, where if I wake you up at two in the morning and ask you after you wash your face and so on to explain it to me, you should be able to do it. So I want you to assimilate right. things here. Right. Another piece of advice I'd give them is, 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 you know, you take a course, even from me, each of you has a different mental framework of facts that they know well, and you must take the things that you learn and relate them to what you know, and redo the course for yourself in a way that makes most sense to you, and it'll be different for most people and so on. So I think these are the kinds of, uh, so I think these are some of the factors that uh, helps you. And then, of course, you know, I encourage them. I, I was very particular about clarity of writing. And my first student, this Dutch student, complained that I made him rewrite his thesis six times. <laughs> Other students have said that I made them do three theses by the time they graduated. <laughs> so it was a challenging atmosphere, and it attracted the top students, and that was a self reinforcing. Uh, thing, you know, so the bright students gravitated to the challenges and so on. And these, the, the, those students, how do they split out from you? Do they go to academia or do they go to companies? What, what happened with those yeah. students? Yeah, well, in the early days, uh, you know, companies were not that. They would go uh, to academia or to Bell Labs or IBM. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had it one, I mean, over the period, perhaps a dozen students at Bell Labs which is, uh, you know, that was the industrial mecca for research. Right. And uh, so uh, in one year, in fact, in a new field that I entered, VLSI, uh, I took a group of students and we studied together this new area. That's how I entered new areas. Uh, and uh, Bell Labs used to have a recruiter, who's unfortunately passed away now, Scott Knauer. They would come out every year and track the progress of different graduate students, looking for people who they could take back to Bell Labs. Well, that year, three of my students in VLSI, the first batch, were graduating together, and he hired all three of them. Uh, he didn't hire, he recommended to his bosses yes. that they hire all three of them. And uh, so this is where I got the quote. So he told me, he says, boss said to him, you know, that's surprising. Aren't there other fish in that ocean there? Mm -hmm. He said, no, but you know, if Tom Kyler's students do three theses by the time they're done. <laughs> <laughs> Not always true, but later, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we put out a lot of work, and uh, the style of uh, working with students changed also, if you want me to talk about it. I do. It. Yeah. At MIT, where I was, you know, the professors did their own research, published their own papers, they had a number of students. They assigned or the students came up with ideas for their thesis and worked sort of individually. I mean, we would talk to each other to learn what they were doing, but each of us did our own thing. And that's the model I uh, adopted when I came from MIT to Stanford. I was doing my own research. My students were each doing different things. They'd publish papers in their own name. So, I mean, till well after I was 
a full professor. Uh, well, only one or two of my papers were co-authored. Hmm. But about that time, I began to think of more, you know, I always sort of, I'm opportunistic in seeing what are new challenges, new opportunities for funding and so on. But at that time, no, my research in communications had led me to study to the need for understanding certain algorithms that were better known in control theory than in communication theory. Now, I could get the books and read them and so on, but I knew that my students were taking courses from colleagues like Gene Franklin and Art yes. Bryson. So I said, mm. hey, tell me, teach me about control theory. Mm. And you know, that's the most effective way because you're one-on-one, -on -one, you can ask them. It helps them think also. And so, uh, you know, I began, then I collected two or three students, so let's learn this together. So we entered the field of uh, control systems and linear systems. And, as I, and I was writing a book on communications, but I got so interested in this, I, I haven't returned to the, to the five or 600 pages that I have. And uh, we wrote a book which got me the IEEE Education Medal because it changed the way the subject of linear systems was taught. Uh, Manjula mentioned E240, many students come yes. to say me that. That's right. and, uh, I acknowledge five students whose PhD work went into the monograph and went into the textbook. Right. So, you know, we So you, you actually changed the, the way you dealt with students in the research and publication right. than when you came from MIT. Right. Is, that, is that reflected across the school now, you think, the, sa the same kind of thing? Well, happening? you know, I learned that, uh, for me, it was selfish in a way because it was a more efficient way of learning about new things. Yes. VLSI, we knew nothing about manufacturing we knew nothing yeah. about we started but this working in teams I picked up from my solid-state colleagues the, in the IC lab and solid-state lab the people work together because they have to do yes. that's my impression I may not be correct in the <coughs> details mm -hmm. and uh, so they work at teams and then they get enough work so that they can get separate PhD theses and so later after the first 10 or 12 years I began to have that model and enabled me to enter every decade a new area while continuing some work in the old area. Let's continue to talk about the students that you had and now and as you think oh, about. this quotation, no. Okay. No, no, but I, I want to move that towards the, it, this development during the time you were at Stanford of the evolution of Silicon Valley and the kinds of students that were attracted to Stanford and to, your, and to work with you and, and your colleagues you want to talk a little bit about how you saw this evolution and, and how Stanford right. played a role in it? Yeah, uh, but a small thing before that. Yes. I mean, uh, to summarize uh, a discussion of students and to end on a joke, perhaps, if you don't mind. I always I'd love say, jokes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say that I was gratified with the, the National Medal of Science citation, which they told me was polished by a committee, uh, mentioned distinctive and sustained mentoring yes, of okay, students. Yes. And that was John Chelf he was that's referring right, to. Because right. they nominate them for awards, I recommend them. Yes, sir. So that was one yeah. thing. The other thing is, uh, John asked, you asked John what questions he should ask me. He said, oh, ask oh, me what's new. That's right, that was a question I, was, I, I yeah. forgot to so ask. Yes. Th the reason is, John was introducing me at one of these Kailath lectures with, perhaps I should spend some time on what my students did for me. Uh, <laughs> And he said, you know, Tom used to say, what's new when you come into class? And uh, now I can tell you what's new. And so he put up capital A, and he, then he said, and uh, uh, new was interesting in our world because that's a Greek letter, new. Yes. And I had a process called the innovations process, new information process, and the symbol I used for it was awesome. new. So John Chuff was one of the students who went through that. And, uh, but he says, now we can tell you what's new. And he wrote A, new, because I got remarried a year or so ago, and my wife is a new. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, when John sent me that quote, I said, well, what does that mean? What's right. possible? So it really represents he your was wife's a, John Freddie Witte. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's a great story. You're right. That's a great story. So let me finish with that students. You know, for my 60th birthday, they organized a five-day international conference, uh, one day for each of the different decades of my work. And we had the top 
people in the world actually in each of those disciplines because in each of these fields we sort of reached the frontiers and defined yes. them. And uh, so they worked hard at it and went off very well. I think you may have noticed some of it when you were, it was at the time you were around here. That's right, I did. Then for my 70th birthday, <coughs> a group of them got together and endowed what they call the Kailath Lectures and Colloquia. Yes, yes. Right. You should be pleased with that. I was pleased with that, and that has a, you know, gone very well. We've had a very distinguished array of speakers, 10 or 12 by now. Yes. And for my 80th birthday, it was their suggestion that we should devote this to just talks by my former students and postdocs. Really? So that's going to happen September 17, 18, and perhaps 19. What a fantastic progression. What's, what's going to happen for your 90th and 100th? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> they'll think of something. <laughs> that's very good. That, right. And I, I'm okay. going to move, but, but I want to... Yes, I now wanna, Silicon it, Valley. No, but I want to continue. Anything else about the student, from a student's perspective? Uh, uh, yeah, you see, they. I mean, as I said, I got top students, and they're a very distinguished bunch. About, as I said, one-third of them... Uh, went into academia. About a third went to mostly research labs in the beginning. But as the entrepreneurial culture built up, and I can talk about that yes, too you. Uh, in your next question, yes. uh, they formed probably over 20 companies. John Shaw, for example, has very successful companies, and he was the pioneer of ADSL. Yes, that's right. Paul Raj, uh, yeah. partly my student and then postdoc, and now a colleague, yes. as John was, yes. uh, is the pioneer of w w MIMO, which yes. is dominant multi-antenna. We grew out of our research projects here. So they've shine, uh, shone, shy, I notice now people don't say shone anymore, they say shined. Shine. It bothers me. <laughs> but New York Times is all over the place. They didn't die, uh, they dove into the water, no, they dived into the water. <laughs> yeah. all right. But uh, all right. what did I want to say? Half of the, if you if you count my postdocs and them, half of them are members of, uh, fellows of IEEE, which They're is very uh, impressive. Very, very impressive. impressive. Were you for, involved? Uh, in, as an advisor or a board of directors for any of these companies that your students started? Yes, I was on a few companies and we founded, co-founded four companies with my students, two of which went public mm. and the other two were acquired. So I was chairman for a while, then one of the directors and so on. So, so you had a chance both to participate in the academic world, but then also in the business world. Yes, and it's quite it's a learning experience to have a company, especially a company as in the growing stages, and then when it's public, you know, the, the different requirements that's of right. quarterly reporting. Uh, absolutely, and, that's right. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. That, that brings us back to the question of Silicon Valley and, right. and how this, yeah. uh, what's happened here in the, the Valley, how it When grew. we came in 63, you know, we were looking for a very young faculty, looking for a place to live. And the Stanford campus was attractive, and we thought of we saw some houses, but they said, well, in three or four years, we're going to open up a new area, which is now Frenchman's Hill. Yes. And so maybe it's wiser to wait because you can get uh, you know, a new home to your liking right. and so on. So we lived in Sunnyvale, huh? which, uh, because, uh, well, we bought a home which appealed to us coming from India. It's called the Eichler. Oh, and uh, that's right. That yeah. was very Open famous after glass, World War II. Right? atriums, yes. and, you know, yes. warm floors. Our kids would move around, yes. exactly as in India. So we loved it. Mm -hmm. There were Eichlers in Sunnyvale, and there were Eichlers in Palo Alto, but Palo Alto was $10,000 more expensive, <laughs> and on my, we couldn't afford it. In fact, for the down payment, a broker loaned us some money to wow. meet the down payment. <laughs> he really wanted to sell it. He else. wanted to sell it, yeah. <laughs> we repaid him in a, less than a year, <laughs> but uh, all changed now, of course. So it was apple orchards and cherry orchards, not apple, apricot and cherry orchards and so on. East of El Camino was mud roads most of the time. Really? Yeah, and I so Hewlett Packard was there and Varian, but no really small companies. We heard about Intel. Yes. And uh, I remember uh, the department, I was on the XCOM at the time, wanted to hire Andy Grove. Yes. Oh. Who was the third employee. That's right. And he was uh, interested, but then he said, no, I think I'll stay with Intel. 
And that's when we heard in 1968 about the microprocessor, that you could have a computer in your pocket. But you know, that's when the value, and of course, we, you know, the value began to take off, and Sunnyvale and the small companies, and now east of El Camino is all built up. So, but what about uh, faculty and companies? That was not very common at that time. The first company I was involved with, we co-founded in 1980. Uh, and I think at the time, there were maybe one or two other uh, E faculty who had companies. Bob Dutton had one, I yes, think. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe computer science, but Bob Cher Cheriton. David probably. Cheriton. Dave Cheriton, yeah. I think, had one. Yeah, I think he started Granite Systems back in there. Uh, yeah, right. right. So it was, it was not uh, usual. Right. And but then so 1980 it was early. After a while it began to be more and more so. So much so that the university had to have rules saying, you know, you should not exploit your students. So your students cannot work in your companies, right. and the research should be separate and so on because it became more and more fashionable. So and uh, Stanford Telecom, Jim Spilko, who's yes. just donated a big building, right. I remember was talking to me. I knew him from the first day I came to Stanford because he'd met me at MIT when he was visiting. And when I came to the Valley, we met. And he was starting Stanford, what he called Stanford Telecom. And he would call me right. to talk about it and so on. And I must say, I was slow on the uptake. I would talk to him and so on, but what I realized later, this was before we formed our company, he was actually inviting me to join him in this new venture. And it just didn't register me. I said, I'm a professor. What am I going to do with the company? <laughs> that was one of my, one of my many mistakes. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to talk about that because I, and having been involved with the dean's office, there were a number of occasions where they, were, they had to address this issue of conflict of commitment and conflict of interest. What is your principal task here? Is it a faculty member or is it to go out and start companies and do that? So I think there's still that challenge within the school Right. of making sure faculty members are focused on what they're being asked to do here. Not that they shouldn't start companies, but be aware of what is your principal task when you're here. Yeah, you know, I mean, the university, I think, came slowly and wisely to defining rules for these things. Yes. One of them, for example, was consulting. It, in engineering, at least, it was almost de rigueur that one day of consulting was necessary, and MIT also, right. to augment your salary. <coughs> yes. But people were consulting three days a week oh. because they said Saturday, Sunday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then I think the university said, no, you know, it's one day, okay. Saturday and Sunday. I mean, you can uh, be a ski instructor, I think Don Kennedy said. That's okay, but not consulting in your area. <laughs> Uh, then they had rules about, you know, proper use of students. And then there's this conflict of interest form. Yes, that's right. Where you had to declare that's right. That's right. what you did and uh, and you had to inform your department chair. It was part of your annual report. You had to Part do of the annual report. Right. is a compliance report. That's I think right. it's a separate yes. report yeah. now. So that has helped because I think they use, there was, people didn't know what the boundaries were and people work hard and so on. But at one time, I think we went overboard, you know, as uh, people were going to Wall Street, people were starting companies, and especially around 2000, just before the bust. Yes. And uh, yes, it was a, it, it was a month. It got it was too a much, yeah. In fact, going people, uh, there was, uh, I must say, at Stanford, in one of the departments in the School of Engineering, one of the interviewers was our interviewees, who happened to be a student of mine, was asked a question. So if you join us here, do you have a company in mind that you want to start? I thought it was a very improper really? question. <laughs> and yet, when you t it's funny, as you talk to undergraduates here, a large percentage, from what I understand, are say, interested in some way starting their own companies. It's the entrepreneurial spirit of those students who come to Stanford. There's a great interest in, in doing right. that. So that has changed. I mean, that was the evolution here. And then it slowed down after the bust. Yes, it did. But, uh, yes. That scared a lot of people. <laughs> but it started again. Yes. But I personally used to, and when we went into VLSI, I'd encourage the students who were with me at the time to think about, you know, starting a company on their own and so on. 
and a couple of them did. Of the three that I mentioned, two of them did. You know, you uh, this idea of starting companies is bridging with industry and bridging between departments. We talked a little bit earlier about about uh, mentioning this bridging, and I know you were a huge proponent of bridging between disciplines. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, you see, I always had sort of broad interests, and. Uh, and I found them useful in the following sense. As I said, you know, I worked for a decade in the beginning in fairly narrow area, information theory and detection theory, it's called. Uh, and then when I moved to controls, it's a different culture. People have different background, what, and so on. But I found it very useful that I could bring ideas that I had learned in communication theory uh, into the controls field. Mm. And this got repeated all over in VLSI. We brought uh, ideas from signal and in semiconductor manufacturing. We brought ideas from control from signal processing into the semiconductor field. For example, a big challenge in the mid 90s, uh, early 90s was lithography is a major bottleneck in producing semiconductors, the most expensive part of it. And you know what this is. You have to print very thin lines by illuminating a pattern with a light source. And uh, it used to be that the light source had a certain width. And the patterns you want, the lines you wish to etch on a, on a substrate for, to make a chip were thicker than the source thickness. Mm -hmm. Imagine a pencil. You're drawing a, a thick line with a thin pencil. It's easy to do. But as you make the lines that you want to draw narrower and narrower, you come to a point where the lines are were smaller than the width of your pencil. Hmm. So what do you do to still draw a narrow yes. line with a thick pencil? Okay. They'd come up with some tricks. But we brought some ideas, and so there was at that time what Gordon Moore and others called the 100 nanometer barrier. That optical lithography would not be able to go make lines smaller than 0.1 micron or 100 nanometers. Uh -huh. And I remember I gave talks on this. TSMC, which is a big fab, started by someone who was a postdoc at Stanford, who got his PhD, Morris Chang. Well, was from Taiwan. Morris Chang was from Taiwan, oh, yeah, right. and he went back yeah, and Morris, started yes, TSMC. Yeah. You know, yes, one right. of the most notable fabs. Right. In '97. He made a speech saying, we won't, optics has run out. Some new ideas to come which we don't know about and we may never know about and so on. I, I may not have the dates exactly right, but we had already broken the barrier. <laughs> 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 he didn't know about it, it was, came out a year oh, later. Really? Yeah. Oh. So this idea of cross but it's not unique to me. I mean, people have noticed cross fertilization, work across disciplines is very, uh, very powerful tool. And, I, and my students also, that's why they say they do two or three PhD theses. I encourage them to think about bringing ideas that they may have learned about or knew about into this area. Uh, the, the key of all of this is, is finding and bringing in the best faculty you, you can find. And Stanford has had an approach of late of, on faculty hires broad area searches. Versus, okay, you know, my oh, uh, oh, my sorry. ears are uh, blocked yeah, because of that's, my that's congestion. Uh, you're talking about to in order to build these bridges, in order that yes. you want to bring in the very best faculty members you can find. Right. And in the last uh, few years, Stanford's approach in the School of Engineering has been to do broad area searches. Right. And uh, you want to talk a little bit about your feelings toward those searches? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think of course Terman was building in a different area. And he went out and sought the best faculty he thought yes. he could find, old or young. Some he brought in, you know, very experienced senior faculty. Others he took a risk on, as we discussed last year with me, and so on. But I think, you know, the world is getting more and more interdisciplinary, and Stanford Engineering is pushing in that direction. But if you have a very young faculty member who has to make his own reputation in the world and so on, it's hard for him to not focus on his major, dis to be discipline oriented, single discipline oriented so that he gets visibility in his field. 
he's able to get letters and so on to be very crass about it yes, for his promotion. Of course. Yeah, to get tenure. So it's not easy for him to think about, oh, how can I work in this different area and bring my skills to it? It takes money, for example, and unless there's another colleague who has big fund to pay your salary and your student's yes. salary while you do that, it's hard to do. So I think you need a mix of senior faculty if you really want to build up an area where you're deficient. You can't rely on getting the very brightest, very young person, and they're remarkable students that we get. But as singletons, they can't quite have the influence that they could have if they were part of a small group. And you know, I was lab director of what we call ISL, the Information yes, Systems, Systems Lab, right. which got a worldwide reputation, actually, as people were saying, it's a brand name, ISL, you say. I mean, MIT, Purdue, and so on would look up to ISL. We had three or four faculty in different areas, information theory. We had the top two or three information theorists in the world because we built a group. We had uh, Tom Cover, oh. before that Norm Abramson, mm -hmm. I was here. Bob Gray we hired, Marty Hellman we hired. Was John Gene Franklin in that group? Who? Gene Franklin, was he part of that group? No, he was on the control side. I see. Yeah. Okay. And, but then we, uh, controls was, uh, I moved into controls, so that gave him support in that area. And then they had, art, we had, uh, controls had the aero group. Mm. Art Bryson, Steve Rock, and All so right. on. But we were known <coughs> for information theory, and then later for controls, because when I moved in there, we got visible. Then signal processing. Bernie Widrow was in signal processing. Uh -huh. I was in signal processing. We had a younger faculty member in that area. So I think we need to hire in clusters. That's my view. Mm -hmm. I mean, but for that, you need one senior, one middle mid-level person perhaps and Stanford has done that I'm mean, not saying we haven't done it but I see less of it and less of a because of this emphasis on new blood young faculty I mean I can't challenge that but you need somebody older and mature who can r rise to the challenges now environment is a challenge energy is a challenge water is a challenge yes. bio is a challenge a young professor can't, I mean, may take time for him. I'll give you a personal example. Please I mean, do. Fabian Pease is one of our well-known faculty. Yes, of course. He used to tell me, and you know, I used to bicycle home past his house, or bicycle with him. He says, Tom, there are so many challenges here. Why don't you look into it? But, you know, I ignored it because, I mean, I had research funding for certain things. If I was to move to that very different area, I'd need a postdoc, I'd need release time, and so on. It's not. We finally moved to manufacturing, and uh, Fabian said to me, he said, wasn't I right? I said, yes, but DAPA gave me $2 million to do that, <laughs> you know? Right. I, where would I get $2 million that's, when you were talking? from the university. <laughs> right. you, know, you wouldn't have done that. No, right, no. Espe yeah. So, you know, it takes that kind of, it takes uh, somebody older and mid-level. Yeah, we're talking about faculty, and I, and I had a, a question I was, I was curious about. Um, when you came in 1963, you might have been the only Indian uh, or of Indian heritage in engineering at Stanford. Is, is that yeah, true? Yeah, I think, uh, no, actually there were only two of us in the School of Engineering. Yes. A professor Karam Chetty in Aero, who'd been here for some time uh -huh. before I came in 63, and then he left a few years later for Florida, I believe. So, uh, I ca then there was Professor Haresh Shah came. Haresh, sure, from uh, civil engineering. Civil yes. engineering, but he came, he was a student here. I knew, I'd met him as a student. Then he went to Penn and came back in 66. Yes. I think he was the second Indian faculty person to be here. And he became chair of the department. Uh, he became chair, very yeah. successful right. chair of the department yes. for 11 years yes. and so on. And uh, now we have uh, more of them. Another, li okay. But, so when we came, you know, my wife and I had just been married. We, soon after, perhaps another of our mistakes, we didn't wait long enough, we had a child very soon. <laughs> <laughs> there was no support system for us. You know, we didn't know uh, older uh, grandparents were far away in yes. India, and there were no Indian families around, and so on, it was hard, you know. One of our neighbors helped us bathe the child. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. so 
it was it was rare. Now, of course, Indians are very prominent in the valley. Uh, absolutely. And the same with Chinese. You know, I remember, I must, without naming names, a very distinguished faculty at Berkeley who used to complain. He said, "Tom, there are no Chinese faculty at you know, in Double E," mm -hmm. and I think Teresa Meng was the first. <laughs> I don't know. That may be true. Yes, yeah. yeah. Th many, many. So when was that? That was mid eighties. Yes, it was. Yeah. Wow. I, you might. That might be true. I, right. I don't know that. But. So you know. But I mean, it wasn't deliberate. It wasn't deliberate. But that's how it worked out. <laughs> it, it's it's interesting to talk about the lack of an Indian community or a support structure for you. And as you say, things have changed quite profoundly now. Right. And we have so many more students from India, and they have throughout the valley, and have created an ecosystem. Right. Uh, that is, in many ways, heavily Indian-based. That's well. right. I uh, mean, there's an organization called TIE, T-I-E. I know TIE. They're having their convention yes. right now. 4,000 people yes. attending. Right. Amazing. Very successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that, I, I'm missing it. They have mentored 50 companies, young companies, and they're having a session, half-day session, in front of VCs where these 50 companies are going to present. Fantastic. So the Indian community and the Chinese also have similar organizations, have made a big impact on this valley. When I got the National Medal of Science, uh, actually President Obama was going to give that, this event was in the morning, that evening he was going to give his big speech on immigration. Yes. So he makes a few general remarks about the awardees, and he said, one of his remarks was, you know, Tom Kailath came to this country uh, at age 22, went to MIT, for his PhD with a research assistantship and then came to Stanford and mentored a generation, a hundred young scholars, what he said. Then he said, Sandus, one of our awardees is Eli Harari. And he started his company, he's from Israel, and his two co-founders, one was from China and one was from India. Hmm. So, you know, we need to make him uh, allow our, our country was built by immigrants and we need to encourage a more liberal uh, immigration policy that allows us to take advantage of these things. So that's what's happening in the valley. It's interesting there's a, a, a from but China. Look at that, China, India, and Israel, among the most dynamic economies that's, right that's, now. That's right. <laughs> it, China has now a policy of sorts where they're trying to recruit Chinese nationals who come yes. to the U.S. I think they're called sea turtles. They come back, right. they're being funded for labs and, and students. Were you ever involved in anything in, in helping India in any of its schooling and, and development? Yes, uh, you know, I, I've been connected with all the, I, the, I never went to an IIT because there was no IIT when yes, I was right. there, yeah. I'm pre-IIT. Yeah. There was one in a remote part of the country which had just started uh, the year before I entered engineering college, uh, IIT Kharagpur. But through a lucky accident, and it may take too long to go into that, I had the opportunity to, well, let me tell you about this, Please actually. Do. Yes. Yeah. You know, India-China had a war in 1962, yes, where the right. Chinese sort right. of wiped out the Indian. And the Himalayas, they fought. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. So a few years later, they began to think about building a radar fence along the Himalayas, so that they would have early warning of movements yes. and things like that. Now, the propagation environment there is difficult. You have to send signals up, have them scattered by tropo scatter, it's called things in the, not the usual mirror reflection of the ionosphere, but you send a signal up, tropo scatters, a lot of small scatters moving around, reflected from all of that, and you get a random process on the ground, and you have to figure out what the signal was. Oh. My thesis happened to be in that area <laughs> <laughs> at MIT. Yes. So I was on sabbatical at the Indian Institute of Science, and uh, the chair of the department was my mentor most of my life. When I went to the School of Engineering in Pune, he was the head of the department, a unique department, a unique individual, a street smart academic. Hmm. You see, yes. uh, now we have more of them, but in those days, they were not so <coughs> smart. So he had wide contacts. One day he got a call from Air Vice Marshal of the Indian Air Force mm -hmm. saying, uh, Chandra, do you, can you help us? We are building this fence, here, radar fence here. We have a lot of uh, companies 
around the world willing to do it on a turnkey basis, but very expensive. And the defense secretary uh, is concerned that maybe, you know, can we not try to do some of these things ourselves and, you know, et cetera. Can you help us? He's, oh. So he said, I have just the person for you. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he, he's visiting in my little, his thesis was in this area. <laughs> so I flew, they flew me to Delhi. Yes. And I met the defense secretary and his deputy, very, very smart guy. The defense secretary was a math graduate from Trinity College in Cambridge. Really? <laughs> yeah. And his deputy was a chemical engineer. So they were unusual bureaucrats at oh. that time, yeah. Uh -huh. So they told me, I said, yes, I think I agree with you. You know, you should have a core team, maybe consultants and people in India, and you can subcontract out uh -huh. to Lockheed and Westinghouse yes, and Raytheon. And you can also insist that, you know, they train your people and so on. And overall, the country will be better off than just giving a turnkey thing for hundreds of billions of dollars yes. and so on. So that reinforced their view. And I said, but you know, you're going to need manpower for this and young generations. So we must reserve some funds for that. I say, okay, you can give a few scholarships. I said, no, I went to MIT and then at Stanford and there's something called the Joint Services Electronics Program, JSEP, you may have heard of it, where the Defense Department, the three services got together, gave block grants to half a dozen universities. Mm -hmm. Stanford would get it. And then Stanford could decide who they would fund with that. So for example, at MIT, it went to RLE and they hired, I was hired by, to work with JSEP funds. When I came to Stanford, they gave me a block grant from JSEP. Mm -hmm. I said, this is the kind of program you will need. Anyway, it took some persuasion and bureaucrats are remarkable people. He said, okay, that's interesting. How much money will we need? Let's go consult the head of the University Grants Commission, who was a f experienced bureaucrat. We went to see him. He said, yes, that's a good idea. So how much money will it need? I thought he said, let me think about it. No, he said, mm -hmm. six crores. This is Indian currency, yes. something. Mm -hmm. Which is a very large amount of money, but why six, not five, what, yes. 12? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just came out of his head. <laughs> that's a funny story. Anyway, so they set up research labs, centers, like RLE, in the five IITs and the Indian Institute of Science. Now, it was a new thing in the Indian scene because faculty were just teachers and they got paid for teaching. Research wasn't part of that. And some faculty were reluctant. They said, you know, if we do research, we'll be measured by what we do. <laughs> so why should I do that? <laughs> anyway, so not all the centers succeeded. I mean, they're still alive because the sunset clauses are yes. hard to. But two or three projects came out of it. One was a project led by Professor Paul Raj, now my colleague, who was a student in IIT Delhi. Yes. And he built for the Indian Navy, working with IIT Delhi and then running the Navy lab, a world-class sonar for the Indian Navy because nobody in the world would sell India technology. He's built a sonar that competes with any of the best in the world. And that, so he learned not just theory, how to build a system that works, what are the field trials. So, so when he came to Stanford, he, he had already made a big reputation in India, and then he started to do theoretical work here. He wanted to work with me. And I said, you know, hey, you're too practical for us. We are all theorists. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, as you talked about what happened. So what I'm saying okay. is, you know, I mean, that's one of the ways, and so I, I used to, and I still go back to India every year, m visit the IITs and so on. But you, it's triggering my thinking, something you, you mentioned uh, about working uh, for the defense ministry in India. Yes. Were you engaged in any way here when the controversy uh, came forth about doing classified research and then spinning out SRI? Were you in any way involved with that? Well, no, I never myself did classic, classified research, but we had, you know, if you remember the old days, we had ERL. Yes, right. Right. I yeah. do. And there was, a, I forget which was ERL and which was McCullough or something, but uh, ERL was a place where only classified research was done, and Joe Goodman, for example, That's right. was right. working there. Right. And Joe's thesis was classified, 
and I think was only very recently declassified 30, 40 years after, 50 years after. So that was a big controversy here. I was in India 69, 70, uh -huh. when, you know, Durand was trashed. That's correct, the fires things, yeah. occurred on campus right. and things. Yeah. But I think it was good that they finally decided to separate classified research from right. the universities. Right. And that was a good, mo it, you know, it, uh, Mike Villard was moved to SRI as a result. That's correct. It certainly makes things uh, much cleaner much to get cleaner, things done yeah. here, where right. everything is Because, you know, shared. university research should be open to the world and so on. Yeah, it, so, uh, let me continue on that. So, if you were thinking about uh, advancing your career today, well, you're a young faculty member based on what you now know, going back in time, would you, what direction would you take? Would you have done anything differently? <coughs> well, you know, it all depends on, uh, as I said, your background and the field you're in. I think if you're a young faculty person, your first priority is to establish your reputation in a discipline. <coughs> now, some, t uh, uh, I mean, it has happened now and it's successful. Some people are bright enough or energetic enough that in a year or two they have an idea and they think, well, I can start a company on the side as well. Yes. And that can happen. But I would, uh, you know, so it depends on your uh, breadth and talent and energy. But the first priority is focus on building a reputation in your discipline and that'll lay a foundation for what you'll be able to do later. Then, at this time I would say there are so many interdisciplinary challenges you can take your discipline, learn about new challenges, and what other disciplines you need to learn or to bring people in. And I would say, for example, environment. And I'll tell you the reason for this, agriculture. I was on a prize committee once in Belgium for awarding prizes, and there were, uh, you know, information theory people, there were, uh, controlled people, there was chemical engineers and so on. The prize went to someone in the, uh, what is it? I would say a broad kind of agriculture, land use, mapping, how do you study this and so on. He had done remarkable work actually, but I and a couple of other members of the committee, it was a very broad committee, the more mathematically oriented one said, you know, but the tools they are using are much less sophisticated than the tools that we know can mm. be used for these problems. They have to estimate frequencies. But electrical engineers have very sophisticated ways of measuring frequency. You don't just use the frequency analyzer that HP used to build 50 years ago and so on. There are cha opportunities there to bring your tools to improve agriculture. Now, I don't know the details. I haven't spent time on it, but I think that's so. Would yeah. you? In your, your personal <coughs> thoughts, would you have done something differently in your career? No, well, no, because I'm pretty, <laughs> so, sorry to say, pretty happy that I uh, seized opportunities in my time as they arose, mm -hmm. including starting companies yes. when they arose. Right. For example, from our work in VLSI, we spun off a company from our work in manufacturing, we formed a very successful company, Numerical Technologies. Yes. So, uh, what was I? No, so I mean, I was motivated to move to different areas, one by the intellectual need from what I was doing, the other by the opportunity that I saw funding. I mean, Star Wars yes. was an opportunity for antenna array processing. Yes. Right. And uh, we did that. We didn't do the classified work on uh, Star Wars, but we did this. And that led to Paul Rogers' work eventually in MIMO, which is now used in every cell phone. So <coughs> I think, you know, people, uh, but now the opportunities are different. It's not MIMO and wireless. You know, wireless is a reasonably established technology mm -hmm. now. Not too much more you can do, in my opinion. Someone will always come up with something. <laughs> but water, challenges, bio is another great area. Yes. But already people working in bio, so, neuroscience. So, let's keep, let me, I want you to reflect a little bit on, of, of your But what it takes though, 
sorry to no. say, it's the source of all evil, they say, but money. Of course. <laughs> if you don't have the funding, it's not going to get done. Not good. That's right. So this is the thing. So when you think about your long career, uh, being at Stanford since 1963, what did you enjoy doing most? What, what brought you the greatest satisfaction while you were here? Oh, the work that I did with my students. You know, because we, uh, in each field, we, working as a, I mean, this is in the l last three or four decades, because in the beginning it was, I enjoyed working with them, but I did, I was very proud of the work I did by myself, yes. and continued and so on. In fact, I was very, very pleased with it. <coughs> but then as I start, you know, and I might tell you that I had a very, very tempting offer after my master's to go work at Bell Labs. And they said, you know, you can get your PhD at Bell Labs by f taking courses, and Columbia will give you a degree. That's correct, the Columbia does that, yeah. And uh, we have famous uh, Shannon is there, and <coughs> you'll have lectures from them. But fortunately, I stayed on at MIT. And after that, I could have gone to Bell Labs, but I came to Stanford. And I was uh, never sorry, because at Bell Labs, in a research group, you work by yourself, you know, you don't. You don't get the multiplier effect that you can have when you work with students. You present an idea to them, and they'll work on it harder than you can by yourself, and besides, as a professor, you have other obligations. They come back to you with some refinement on your idea. You interact with them, that gets refined. He works with two or three others, it all works together. Yes. Intelligence amplification, that's what's happening. It, it's uh, good. Yeah, and that's what, a pro so Bell Labs, you don't get the intelligence amplification that you get in a university. Well, that, that's this, this idea of that your legacy exists in the students who, that's right. who you've taught, right? right? And they teach the others. The students and the, and the work, the, the publications and books and right. so on, that were, that's, a, that's right. my and legacy. And, and, and that's the one where you think about the tree from Tom Kyleth as it extends that's right. out. That's right. And long after you and I are gone, that tree will continue to extend. That's right. And that's what, uh, that's right. when you think about a career, that's what you We had to make of. some you know, philanthropic gifts, which we considered. And uh, one of the more recent ones we made, actually, I might mention, is a fairly large gift to MIT uh, to support, uh, you know, there was a question, can you name a room in a building or a... I said, no, I believe in this intelligence amplification, so this scholarship will support a double E graduate student who will work with people in the cancer center to progress, yes. because this is in memory of my late wife, yes, right. who passed away from cancer. Right. So I figured, you know, and this is the thinking that I mean, rather than have a building, which has its own value and so on, I'm not challenging that. Right. And I, we couldn't endow a building, we could endow a room in a building. No, I thought it was more valuable to endow, so the same thing. I, uh, same I actually philosophy. think that's commendable, I, I agree, in the sense <coughs> that your gift will support students who will do research that will have meaning. Right, yeah, the and then they'll have students and they'll do right. work and you know, this, right. it's the seed that you plant which grows into a tree. So you mentioned your, your late wife, and uh, so what about personal family life? What, what impact did that have on Stanford in your career? Oh, I, uh, you know, my wife was, uh, we got married when she was 21, just graduated with a degree in English literature. Had never really moved, with some small exceptions, moved out of a small village that mm. she grew up in Kerala. And then we came to, the West in this country. And I remember, as we were flying, she was amazed at doors that would open automatically. <laughs> <laughs> Escalators. Uh, yes. <laughs> she said, do Western women all have webbed feet? <laughs> webbed Stockings. Feet? Oh. In India, you never know oh, you ever saw that. Interesting, <laughs> webbed feet. <laughs> That's funny. So, but you know, she was bright. She blossomed and grew and, you know, and so I was reading in the New York Times letter recently was saying, wives are CEOs. They manage the house, they care, take yeah. care of the kids, they do social work, they, you know. That's, my wife was the CEO of the home. <laughs> and how, how many children did you have? We have four children. And are they still here in and around uh, Stanford? Yeah, no, uh, we had two in quick succession, 14 months apart. As yeah. I said, we were young and didn't know much uh, about the world and <laughs> so on. 
Uh, but anyway, so our oldest is a girl. She's a physician in Boston. Uh -huh. Our second son had a, uh, is working in Bangalore. Oh, doing some of his stuff, but helping me with uh, some properties we have in Bangalore and a charitable trust mm -hmm. that Sarah established, which is very nice, doing mm -hmm. well. Our third daughter is uh, a teacher, a college teacher in San Francisco mostly in ESL, mm. English as a second yes, language. Right. And she is doing a lot of social work also and helping. That's a nice family. That's yeah. very nice. And then 14 years after the youngest, we had a, a boy who lives in Manhattan now and had a degree in English literature, but he couldn't find a job in English literature. But he was a self-taught computer whiz, so he worked as a web designer He's gotten tired of that and says, I can't see myself writing code. Mm -hmm. all <laughs> so he's enrolled in radio journalism, just graduating, and is interning with NPR. Really? He wants to, do, he wants to be a, what a, and he's had some of his stories picked up and presented on NPR. That, you know, that's a terrific diversity. You have people in the technical fields? Yeah. And people in the-, in well, the Nobody, they didn't want to do math like their dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure some of that got, got in the system, though, over, over time. You know, I was talking, I had sent a note out to some of your colleagues, and there was one, an interesting one. Marty Hellman, faculty member in EE, who, uh, he suggested I ask you about building your house on campus when you were on sabbatical <laughs> in India, and the role Barbara, Barbara, oh, Barbara McKee, McKee. McKee, who was your assistant, you know, played in that. Uh, I was blessed in many ways. I mean, I was blessed in my parents, blessed in my uh, wife, late wife, and now I'm remarried, fortunately. Yes. Another lucky charm, another yeah. brilliant woman. And I was blessed with my uh, staff. Barbara McKee came to Stanford after high school and secretarial school, in, uh, you know. And after the first year, she started working with me as my assistant and worked with me for 27 years. <laughs> going through all the technological changes, yes. mimeograph, purple yes, stuff, yes, right. Selectric, IBM Selectric, yeah. TROF, <laughs> Unix, <laughs> Word, amazing. So I was blessed with that. And uh, then our group got so large that I had two admins <coughs> at one time, and that was Chris Linky. But then Barbara, got married and moved away after 27 years. <laughs> but Chris Linke stepped up and worked with me for half a dozen years and ran the big international conference for my uh, 60th birthday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then went to law school and did well and went to Hewlett Packard and so on. So they are very important. I mean, they, Barbara, many of my older students and colleagues Never bothered to ask me things. They would just ask Barbara. And <laughs> that, <that's, laughs> now, yeah, going back to Marty. Yeah, <coughs> and the house. You know, Sarah had wanted to have a third child in India, born in India. We started to build the house in 68, the, baby, uh, the fall of 68. The baby was due in June or July of 69. So you have to go to India before that. Yes. But houses take longer than you think. <laughs> So she had to leave, and I had to leave a little later. So there were still things to be done. And so we entrusted Barbara with our checkbook <laughs> 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 and supervision, and we had another wonderful friend of Sarah's and her husband who helped you know, choose fixtures, because at the end, end part of a house is very hard. You've got to choose lights and things Did like that. you trusted Barbara to do all of that? Barbara, no, Barbara working with Billy Lee, with his Bill. friend. Were you satisfied with the end result? Yes. That's of good. course, many years later, we uh, made <laughs> modifications. <laughs> so Barbara, story. Barbara, uh, Sarah used to say, Sarah, Barbara, and I grew up together. Ah. Because we were, I mean, I was six years older than them. Barbara and Sarah were roughly the same age, 27 years. So she became part of the family. Of she course. traveled with us to India, to Europe. We would invite her over and so on. So it's, it's, it's you, the key to doing the work that you need to do was to have the people who could back you up. That's right. And worry about the things that you don't want to worry about. Right. Like doing. That's yeah. the, now, that's I was negligent in that sense, I must say. I mean, I, in retrospect, I could perhaps have spent, I should have spent more time with the family and kids, but Sarah handled it. And, 
that's how it is. That's they're now reconciled to that's, it. That's very good. Now, uh, I, I do want to make a comment on the fact that um, you really have quite a distinguished career that's been recognized by the National Academy of Engineering, the Academy of Arts and Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, uh, along with lots of international medals, awards, yeah, honorary uh, degrees. The foreign membership, uh, one of the proudest things is the foreign membership of the Royal Society of London. That's correct. Then you've won virtually every IEEE award. Yes. I, uh, I'm not, I, I looked, I don't think there are any that you haven't won, and certainly <laughs> for your discipline. And then last year, uh, you were a recipient of the National Medal of Science, this country's highest award in science. Right. So y can you reflect on what all this recognition means to you and your career at Stanford? Well, <laughs> of course, naturally, I'm very pleased uh, with these uh, recognitions. And I'm very indebted to, to the many people who nominated me for these things and did the hard work required to do that, which is why I still spend a large amount of time, though I'm retired, writing, le John Chaffee referred to it, writing letters for former students, yeah. for others, I worked in four different fields, so I'm getting requests from many fields. Right now, there are three National Academy references that I've shepherded, uh, nominations and references and so on. So uh, I'm losing my thread a bit here. But uh, no, so, uh, sorry, say oh, again, where, where uh, were yeah, we? Reflect on this recognition oh, you've yeah, received. Yeah, no, what the thing I want to say is, you know, you do the work for the sake of the work, not because you think you, I mean, people who, uh, Nobel Prize is a different category, there's no, right. yeah. Right. There you think, you know, if I figure out the structure of DNA, I'll get a Nobel Prize, and maybe you go to that. Linus Pauling was driven by that kind yes. of thing, among many other, but almost everyone does the work for the sake of the work and the challenge of the work. If an honor or prize comes along, that's a, that's a nice icing on the cake, but you don't do the work because you think uh, your work is so, that's mine. I mean, I'm happy that we did so much work. I'm pleased with the work that we did, with the students who helped me, the staff who helped me, the family who helped me, the colleagues around the world with whom we, we traveled widely. Mm -hmm. They sent me their students. I have three of them at the Technion, for example. Yeah, Mr. Mark, yes, they yeah. gave me an honorary degree and so on. So. No, I'm happy with how things are working. I feel blessed, that's what I yes. say. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, as a boy growing up essentially, you know, in a very middle-class <coughs> family, but having some academic dreams. And recently I was in Florida with a fellow student of mine from MIT, Bob Gallagher, who gave the first Kailath lecture, a very distinguished yes. information. And we were reminiscing, you know, when we were students together, did we imagine that uh, what nice things life had in store for us? When you were a student, you barely had enough money to buy food and have <laughs> lodging, and you could never envision that same thing happening. No, life, right. Life would be like Buying a that. book, for example, you know, no. I mean, I, my dad, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, and so movies were even a luxury yes. for us. But books, he was willing to spend for books. So, the, but you know, in my early years at Stanford, I would hesitate to buy a, an expensive book. But you know, it's I feel one reason you feel better off is if you want a book, you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it so, in ninety in two thousand one, you became a emeritus fa faculty right. member. Uh, so that's now fourteen years. How have you been spending your time the last fourteen well, years? Well, you know, two thousand one, I sort of retired from classroom teaching. Yes, but I had research funding and research projects mm -hmm. with DARPA mostly. So I finally pretty much retired. I tapered down in 2006. So how do you spend your time? What do you do? Yeah, well, <laughs> I find myself quite busy. Uh, where does it go? I mean, I read. I, I take the mornings easy. I read the New York Times and the San Jose Mercury. Uh -huh. I read books. Uh, we have a lot, lot of books. My wife also is a book lover. But I find I'm writing a lot of letters for people. I'm nominating people. Good. I'm on committees. I travel, I give uh, lectures. I was at, in Korea, another remarkable pro country that has progressed. I gave two weeks of lectures at KAIST. Yes. And so then I was re most recently in Florida and uh, 
Iowa City giving lectures. So you're not slowing down? Sorry? You're not slowing down? No. But I want to tell you a story. The lecture that I gave recently was with a very unusual title for me, The Process of Making Breakthroughs in Engineering. Oh, where was that? Where did you do that? No, so I tell people now when I give the lecture, it says, you know, it's an, I've never given a talk, I had until recently given a talk like this because you don't think about that and there are no rules for this. But one day a year, a year or two ago, there was an email from someone in Ecuador whom I did not know saying there's going to be a convention of Latin American and Caribbean engineering institutions, an annual convention. It's going to be in Ecuador this year and we would like you to give the keynote lecture. They didn't say what the lecture should be on, but we will fly you first class, and at the end of the uh, conference, we will give you a five-day holiday in the Galapagos Islands. Wow. It's been a dream of ours, which I never realized, to visit the Galapagos. <coughs> so I said, yes, that's interesting. <laughs> but let me tell you, I said, that I have recently been, I have recently remarried. Back comes an email, she can accompany you. Good. Then I asked her, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you made the commitment. Now you have to figure out what to do. That's funny. Yes. Then they presented this topic. So I said, you know, I don't give talks like that. Yes. And there are no rules on this. But I thought, it's, apart from the bribe aspect of it, I thought it was challenging. So in fact, I consulted with some of my colleagues and so on. And I put together a talk starting with quotations from Thomas Edison, who was a breakthrough yes. master. And, st and of course, then I took breakthroughs from some of my friends, Jim Spilker and GPS yes. was one of the breakthroughs. And there are some rules like, don't let failure deter you, don't let negative criticism de detect you, bring ideas from different fields, work hard, etc. And some of the things in retrospect that we did in VLSI and lithography and even in mathematics were breakthroughs. You didn't think of it at the time. Yeah. So it's come out to be a rather a nice talk and I've been giving that now three times now. So are those um, slides or, or video of that talk posted anywhere or not? Uh, that people might see? Yes, there is a video from Korea, I think. I think they ha there's that a video. At hmm? at uh, I'll have to find Geist? out. They 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 publish the no, the notes in a book form, but you know the slides by slides by themselves need the verb. Right, because you tell stories around around them. Means. Yeah, but the idea that sounds like yeah, it, was it a should be video. I don't know if they videotaped it in Ecuador, but I improved it after Ecuador was the first time. Yes. So the next time I give a talk, I'll insist that it be videotaped. You should do that, and that might be perhaps something even within the school. Because that's a great reflection on what, is it, what it that's takes right. to be successful. That's uh, right, yeah. So uh, as we begin to move towards the end of our conversation, are there any questions that you wish I had asked you or anything else you want to add to our conversation? No, I think you've been pretty comprehensive and you've been, uh, as I think about it, Jen, let me, give me a moment. Sure. No, as I said, I've mentioned my kids. I've mentioned Sarah, my new wife is, is Anu, Anu Radha. Yeah, Anu, that's John a great Chiaffi, story. Yes, right. John Chiaffi What's new? <laughs> joke, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we are happily married. We now live in Atherton. And so I have one last question, and that is that we sort of got to it a, a moment ago, but maybe you could you now reflect on this. And as you think about your time you know, here on Earth, it, what would you like your legacy to be? If, pe if people could remember you, what, are they, what do you want them to think about? What, what legacy do you want to leave behind? Well, you know, apart from the things I said, the work we did, the students I worked with, uh, I, I, and I think more about it these days, I think people will remember me as approachable and, and helpful and, and friendly. And in fact, there's a story which I'll tell you after, where, you know, uh, I think being kind has paid off uh, for them and for me in various ways. And perhaps sometimes I think I was a little too strict with people mm. and I should perhaps have been kinder. But I think generally people will regard me as helpful. Helpful. That's great. So, Tom, I'm, I want to thank you for our time together. I've learned a lot. 
I've I've known you for many years, but not right. at any yes. level like this. Right. Yeah. So now I know. I feel like I know you much better than I ever could, and I think the kind of, the story you told is a is a fantastic story about you and Stanford what it was like to be a faculty member at Stanford and what this university is like. Oh yeah, you asked me about colleagues. You know, that's one thing we didn't fully explore. Who were the colleagues at Stanford that influenced oh, me? Oh, well, let's see that then. Yes, so if it, it's over, but... It's over, but they, this is a nice... They can splice it. Yes. It's, it's a, a post, postscript. <laughs> no, you see, Norm Abramson brought me to Stanford. Yes. That's a story in itself. Okay. And then through a sad confluence of events, he left. He resigned and he left. But he's done well for himself. He's a pioneer in Aloha Net and Ethernet mm -hmm. and so on. So he was there. Alan Peterson, who has passed away, I don't know whether he was here when you came. No, I don't recall. He was in Star Lab. He was in Star Lab. He was a, a mentor for me and helped me uh, with consulting opportunities. He had a very wide network, and I acknowledge him in my book. So now, uh, Tom Co uh, of my immediate colleagues, Tom Cover. Tom Cover, yes, right. Had just joined the faculty a year after I came. He right. was my closest colleague. Gene Franklin, of course, was a senior faculty, and Bernie Widrow. Yes. And then I must say, I profited from the environment, and it was unique, and it, it can't be repeated very often, that Terman and Linville built, which suited me very well, which was the focus to make Stanford visible, Terman believed that <coughs> their faculty should become visible through their research. And, uh, and through the stu bright students that they produced, not necessarily all of them, but the top students. So the committee burdens were low at Stanford. I must say undergraduate teaching was not a priority. A full curriculum was not a priority. There were gaps in our curriculum. But Terman would say, and Linville followed, that uh, the students will fill in. It's okay, you can't teach them everything and they have to learn new things, so they did that. They allowed the faculty to relate their teaching to their research. So when I changed fields, I taught new courses related to them. We, they allowed me every two years to have an advanced seminar course, which led to new research and books and so on. So the focus on r producing good research and the hurdles we put in the way of our students are much less, not hurdles I would say, the challenges we impose on our students to get their PhD degree are much less than at a school like MIT. So the average MIT PhD is better trained, I would say, than the average Stanford PhD. But the top Stanford PhDs are the equal of mm. the top MIT or top Berkeley and so on. Mm -hmm. And so Terman and Linville's focus was on the top. Now that doesn't sound politically correct, but I think that helped build Stanford. And my career therefore profited from that because I enjoyed moving, teaching with, relating my teaching to my research. It's and so on. So, this notion but of, uh, times are changing now. But what you're saying is that what makes Stanford, I think, unique, along with its peer schools like Berkeley and MIT, is to recruit and have the best students on the planet come right. in. Yes. Wherever they are, who can then work together with mentors and faculty right. members like you. That's what I think makes this place quite special. Well, Tom, thank you very much. This has been, for me, quite enlightening, and I hope for you it was, has been an enjoyable experience. I forgot to say that SCPD also brought us some good students because they would take the classes, then they'd come and see us. They would from industry. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Tom, thanks very much. I appreciate your time.